Hey, I've got a question for you. Can your network survive a pug? Okay, what about a baby? If it can't, if you can't afford to lose one link or one switch or one router, you're doing it wrong. In this video, I'm gonna show you two network architectures that can help make our networks awesome. And a huge, massive shout out to Boson Software. They are the official sponsor of this free CCNA series. And if you're trying to get your CCNA, which I assume is probably a lot of you, Boson has the best labs, practice exams, and now the best courseware you can find for the CCNA. I'm actually giving away three copies of their courseware and labs in the link below. So enter that contest, it ends tomorrow, Friday. So hurry up. Now, before I show you what a good network design looks like, just a beautiful, mwah, delicious one, let me show you a bad one first. As you're working towards becoming a network engineer, you're gonna see some bad networks. And it's your job to identify why they're bad and how you can make it good. Now, to find a bad network, you don't have to look very far. Look in your house. I'm not kidding, your home network sucks. <laughs> no, I know a lot of you probably have an amazing home network and you know, Comment below with what you have. But for a lot of you, if you ran a business out of your house and you use that home network, it just die. You, your business would be dead. Now I say that because a lot of businesses, when they first start out, their network looks very similar to a home network and they make some big boo-boos, some very big mistakes. Let me show you what it might look like. So Network Chuck Coffee, still a very young, small, growing coffee company. And let's say I trusted a noob to install my network. <laughs> I would never do that. But let's say I did. Very similar to your home network, I'll have a router. Although in your home network, your router isn't just your router, it's also your switch, your modem, even your WAP. No, not the song, a wireless access point. This is a networking video, get your head straight. <laughs> so it's doing a lot, which is a horrible thing. Uh, <laughs> you don't wanna have one device doing everything. And we'll get into why that's important here in a moment. But for now, my coffee company just has the router and my router connects to a switch. And honestly, for a small business, this is fine. I've got my computers connected to my switch. I'll have a WAP, the wireless access point, connected to it as well, giving me Wi-Fi to all my people, maybe a few phones, and then of course my server to run my website. Well, hold on a second. My switch only has 24 ports. I'm out of ports. I have more things to connect, more computers, more servers. What do I do? Well, I tell my noob network engineer to fix it for me. And this is where the noob really screws up. What does he do? Well, he gets another switch. It's fine. He does a great job getting that. Here it comes. And then he connects the switch to the switch and then, oh, oh, hold on, what did you do? Hold on, what, what did you do? <laughs> this is bad. I'll explain why here in a moment. And before long, I'm growing, I'm growing like crazy. So I need to add another switch. So my new network engineer does another, another switch and he <laughs> adds it out here and, and then he, he does it again. He connects this switch to that switch. Ooh, oh, I'm sure a lot of you, if you know networking, this is probably scaring you. It, it makes me just have heart palpitations just thinking about it. This is bad. Now it works, don't get me wrong, this totally works. But then this happens. My pug Moses comes over and starts chewing on this cable right here. Then suddenly, boo, the cable breaks. <laughs> and then what happens? Well, all the devices connected to the switch and this switch, they gone. They can't connect to anything, right? They're down. This right here is what we call, now say it with me, a single point of failure. Don't ever have those in your network ever. All of these right here are single points of failure which basically means if one thing fails, then most of your stuff goes down. Never wanna have that. Now again, this design still works. You might have something like this in your house. There are a lot of businesses that have this and it works most of the time until something fails. In your home, you can afford it to fail because the worst thing that can happen is you miss an episode of Netflix or worse, you can't watch my next video, whatever. But in business, that means dollars and cents. That's money, time. Now I'm showing you this because you will see this in the wild, in the real world. And you have to tell them why it's dumb <laughs> and you have to fix it. So how do we fix this? What do we do? Well, some might think, well, you know, we have those single points of failure. Let's just add another connection. We could do that. Add another cable here, another cable here. That's better, but what if the switch goes down? What if this switch goes down? We still have glaring problems and this is not ideal, which is why we have two designs we're gonna talk about today. It'll help us become redundant and you'll hear that word a lot when you're talking about network design. You wanna remove as many single points of failure as you can. So you wanna be able to have a cable go down but things still be up. A switch goes down but things still be up. Let me show you what that looks like. So daisy chaining our switches together, bad, don't do that. So what do we do? How can we make this better? Well, we could do this, watch. Let's put the router right here. And instead of daisy chaining, we just connect our switches to the router, each one. Done, that was easy, come on. Chuck, you're making it sound so hard. Well, we're not quite done. Now this will work, but it's not ideal. So for example, my computers. This works great for when they wanna to get to the internet because that's what the router is great for, layer three. But my computers and my servers aren't just talking to the internet, they're talking to each other. They're talking on the same network. And that's where the router becomes less ideal and he's not the best guy for the job. So what we want is another switch. 
but not just any switch. Oh, <laughs> you're gonna love this. This is something when I found this out, I'm like, <sighs> mind blown. So we're gonna scooch the router up here for a moment. He's still in play, but we're gonna talk about something else here. We're gonna bring in this guy right here. <laughs> what is that? It's a switch, but it's not just any switch. This, my friends, is a multi-layer switch, often referred to as a layer three switch, which might sound weird if you've watched my previous videos. We know that switches, they deal with layer two MAC addresses and routers deal with layer three IP addresses. What's a layer three switch doing here? That's sci-fi, that's weird, I can't deal with that. No, it's amazing. It's literally a switch that can deal with IP addresses and MAC addresses, it can do it all. And it's blazing fast. And then our multi-layer switch will connect to our router and we're looking a bit better right now, aren't we? I mean, it's really beautiful. If, if this connection goes down or this switch goes down, then these two are still up. This computer's still up, this server's still up. It's better, right? And I'm sure you're thinking, well, Chuck, we still have this right here, this single point of failure. Yeah, we'll get to that. We're taking baby steps and you'll encounter this a lot when you design networks for businesses because designing a network with limited single points of failure can be crazy expensive. The more devices you add, the more the bill goes up. So I'll show you how we can fix this single point of failure here in a moment, but just know the more we add, the more it costs. You'll have to work with the business and what their budget is. Now this architecture, this model here, the way we designed our network is called a two tier architecture. Let me show you the tiers right now. Here's tier number one and tier number two. The switches in this tier one are called our access switches and we'll, we'll call this layer our access layer because they give our devices, the things we connect to our switches, you know, where my cables go? Hold on. Things like Raspberry Pis, giving them access. Ooh, that sound. Let me add a Pi in there real quick. Can't not have a Pi, Raspberry Pi in my uh, network here. What am I, crazy? There we go, much better. And then our tier two layer, this guy is called our distribution layer. And of course, this would be our distribution switch. Why is he called that? Well, because his job is to distribute all the packets, all the frames throughout the network. Like he's it. Everything goes through him. If the computer wants to talk to my server, well, the computer goes, Access switch, distribution switch, down to access switch, down to server. If he wants to access the internet, access switch, distribution switch, router. Now, because everything goes through him, he's got to be pretty bulky. He's got to be, ah, <laughs> he's got to be big. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think about computers. This Raspberry Pi, while he's awesome, he's not like a computing powerhouse. He's tiny. You're not going to be playing Call of Duty on this guy. Well, not yet. We, you never know. He's not powerful enough. And the same goes with switches. If you got a tiny little eight port switch, he can only handle so much traffic before he's like, I need help. So don't put a tiny little eight port switch in your distribution layer. He'll die. <laughs> so uh, in the distribution layer, you'll want a massive switch with a lot of horsepower. And just like a computer, it'll have more components, more expensive hardware to make it faster. Now I've shown you access layer switches. It's something like this, but distribution layer switches are a whole other beast. Emphasis on beast. Let me show you one real quick. Here are a list of Cisco switches that could be considered distribution layer switches. And you, you've got options. And it all depends on what you need and really how much you can spend. So like right here, we have the Cisco Catalyst 3850s. They have a very similar form factor to the access layer switches, but they can handle a lot more. Like look here, 480 gigabits per second on their backplane, which means they can handle that much traffic going through them at once, which is a lot. But of course, if you need more, you can get more. You go up to the Cisco Catalyst 6500, you got 11.4 terabytes per second or terabits per second. And look at that thing. <laughs> it's crazy looking, look at that guy. And we'll, we'll cover more about these guys here in a moment because they can go bigger and they have a different role. We'll touch on that here in a moment. Now we haven't gone too deep down the Cisco rabbit hole just yet. We will, don't worry. So I kind of glossed over what the distribution layer is responsible for. It does more than just distribute. Like let's take a field trip over to the Boson courseware real quick. You'll want to get this stuff. I've got their courseware open. Now let's learn about the distribution layer real quick. If you want to get this, I've got a link below. Now I didn't mention this before, but the distribution layer is sometimes referred to as the aggregation layer. Let me highlight that. <laughs> That's the worst highlighter ever. Better, okay. <laughs> but it does things like route filtering, enter VLAN routing, management ACLs, IPS, security policies, routing, because remember they are layer three, and then summarization and next hop redundancy. I said a lot of words that we have not covered yet, we will. Just know that those are the roles that the distribution layer typically has, or the ones we give it, give to it. Now there is something I skipped over, you may have noticed this. Because the distribution layer is the intermediary between the access layer and the core layer. What's the core layer? <laughs> I didn't talk about the core layer. Well, hmm, if I scroll up just a little bit, look at this. 
There's another layer? What? What is that? We'll talk about that. Right now, we're only looking at the distribution layer and axis layer, which is called the two-tier architecture. And we'll, we'll, again, we'll touch on it here in a moment. Now, let's talk about these other single points of failure. How can we fix things? Well, we can add more devices, right? Like, check this out. I can add one more distribution layer switch. We do that. Scoot him over right here, and we'll connect our switches. So it might look like this. We'll add one more connection, one more connection, one more connection. Then, of course, we'll connect our switch to the router, and then we'll even connect our two switches to each other. This is what I'm talking about. We've got two distribution layer switches. No, no longer a single point of failure. We've got two links to each switch. That's amazing. And then we have two connections to our router. But wait, hold on. We still have one router. We can solve that. Let's solve that right now. Let's put in one more router. And we'll connect both switches to them. Man, look at all that redundancy. It's beautiful. But it's expensive. This is ideal. <laughs> a lot of companies aren't willing to pay that much for stuff because these, I mean, oh my gosh, these layer three switches, they could be like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Same for the routers, just depending on how big you go. No one said networking is cheap, which is why we make the big bucks. Now this two tier architecture isn't the only kid on the block. And let me show you where a three tier architecture might come into play. Let's say Network Chuck Coffee really just starts booming. Like, oh my gosh. And we have to add more buildings just to hold all our people. We have so many people now. Now we have three buildings, things are booming, it's amazing. But we need to connect our buildings together so we can all, you know, have a network. That's what we're doing here, right? All right, let's connect them. So I'll connect my multi-layer switch to my multi-layer switch down here, my distribution layer. Same thing, let's go over here and let's do it right here. Just random, but hey, we got connectivity, right? Ah, uh, but let's make sure we add in some redundancy. We'll also add redundant links. Make sure each switch has a connection to each switch and each location has a connection to each location. Okay, we did it. It's kind of a mess, but we did it. Ah, oh, we have another building coming in. Okay, get ready, guys. <laughs> I gotta hire some more network engineers. All right, so let's connect them. Here we go. Okay, this is getting a little crazy. As big as our distribution switches are, they're under fire right now. They can't handle all this stuff. Too many connections, they're running out of ports. We're maxing out the bandwidth. What do we do? Let's go with a three tier architecture. You saw that coming, right? Let's do it. Get all those connections out of there. Whew, stressing me out. We're gonna add one more layer here. So let's get our routers out of here or scoot it up. We're not gonna get rid of them. And we'll put our next layer in. And this layer will have a beast of a switch. It will also be a layer three switch, but this will be the big daddy. He'll be so powerful, so awesome. He can handle all that traffic. This switch is our core switch, and this is our core layer, tier three. Our distribution layer switches will connect up to him. In a perfect world, we'd have two of our core because he's the, he's the main guy. And we connect them up and our cores will be connected to each other. And then we'll connect our routers to our core switches. This is a beautiful, lovely campus network design. Oh, so good. Expensive, but good. Okay, now what's this core layer doing besides just being awesome and powerful and huge and blah? Let me show you. Let's go look at Boson. So the access layer, we know he's connecting our devices, our, our phones, our, our computers, everything. He's the access layer. Distribution, we just talked about him. Now the core layer, what is he doing? Look how short his paragraph is. <laughs> that is truly sums it up here. He's like that massive guy at the gym, just over you know, there, oh, oh, is grunting. That's all he does is grunt and lift. That's what this guy does. He's just fast <laughs> and, he, and he's uh, associated with low latency and high reliability. So the core switch is expensive, reliable, and beefy. Because he is the network backbone and a ton of traffic goes through him, he has to be able to handle a lot. The weight of the network's on his shoulders. So this is our Cisco three tier network design model. Core distribution access. Now I wanna talk real quick about the, the two tier. The two tier had the core layer gone, but no, no, hold on. He wasn't gone. He was still there or his role was still there. That just became the job of the distribution layer. Let me show you real quick. I'm gonna scroll down through Boson's amazing courseware and get to the Cisco two-tier network design model. Notice what they call it, the collapsed core layer. This model is often referred to as the collapsed core model. I don't know what happened to my D there, just ignore him. But the functions of the core were collapsed into the distribution layer. So the distribution switches have all the responsibilities of the distribution sw switches, right? They have to do a bunch of the routing, the inter-VLAN routing, access control lists and such. Like, did they do a lot? And then they have to also be the backbone of the network. They have to be powerful and crazy, which in most cases is A-OK -okay and fine. I've seen more collapsed core or two-tier models than I've seen three-tier. 
Three tiers fantastic for what I'm about to show you right now. Looking back at our four buildings here, here's our new design with a tier three. Notice that only one of the buildings has the core layer, the tier three layer, and that's the design, right? The core layer is the core for the entire campus. So now you can imagine how this might simplify things. Our distribution layers will connect back to our core layers, but just to the core layers, not to each other with that full <laughs> nasty mesh like we had before. This allows us to scale a lot easier if we have a massive campus. So this is a bit better. My drawings are horrible. Let me show you a better uh, view from Cisco's perspective. They, Cisco has great documentation. Here's how buildings will connect without a core. We, we just saw this, it's just a, a mess. It's so not scalable, right? It's too complex. But if you scroll down just a little bit, here's our core and it solves a problem. It's beautiful, a lot more clean. We have our one core and then we have all our tier one and tier twos in our buildings. Now, do you want to see a core switch and how big it might be? Looking back at uh, Cisco's available distribution and core switches, that's what this is called. Find the best core and distribution switch for you. Um, if you are on the far right, it's the smaller stuff. If you go to the very far left, you get bigger and bigger and bigger until you get to the big daddy, the Cisco Catalyst 9600 series. This thing's a beast. They're modular, so you can just slide in extra little features and awesomeness. They've got redundant everything. And look at the available backplane or bandwidth it has 25.6 terabits per second. It's pretty crazy. If you want to see one of these, actually, uh, David Bomble and I went to Cisco headquarters in, in San Jose and we got to talk with the guys who designed it. They walked us through it. So I got a video below if you want to check that out. Actually, I'll play a clip right now. Free file, dude. Oh, yeah. That's no, nice. That, that feels high quality. That's nice. Wow. Huh? You can see that they are hefty, yeah. and so that's also another future proof uh, for delivering power. They had just released it, and they let us take a look at it and play with it. Crazy. Now, as I mentioned before, this model right here is the one I've seen the most of. It's what I've worked with the most. The collapse core, where you have your access layer doing its thing <laughs> on both uh, sets of uh, designs. But then you have your collapse core. The distribution switches also being the core switches, and then these switches will connect up to your routers. When we're looking at tier three, I love looking back at that Cisco example. This is why you want to have a tier three. When you have a bunch of buildings in a campus that all need crazy high speed connection to each other, like they're all in the same building. So we call it a campus and really where we got the term from is like a, a college campus, a school campus. I went to Cisco's campus and they have like a bajillion buildings. I got lost uh, multiple times and they have stuff like this. I mean, they invented it, right? So they, they invented it because they probably needed it. But what I found is most companies we, I've worked for, we have one main corporate office and we had our core distribution switches connecting to our access switches and that's all we needed. Now that's just the campus that's connecting our people and our users in the same building. We have more than that though. We also have data centers and how we design our data centers. We have cloud and how we design our connections to the cloud. We have our WAN, we have our um, small office, home office, we have our users, all kinds of different things. We're gonna talk about all those here in the next few episodes. Now I've got some homework for you. Here's what I want you to do. Most of you work for a company, right? You may be in their IT department. You may not be in their IT department. doesn't matter. What I want you to do is find out what design they have. Is it two tier? Is it three tier? Is it some weird tier? I don't know. Find that out and let us know in the comments below. I think that'd be really fun to see everyone's uh, design and their network. And that was episode six. Let me know what you think. Comments below if you have any questions or just suggestions, let me know. Or if you need help, let me know as well. And by the way, did you know I have a Discord community? Discord's a place where you can go and get help. I've got about 14,000 people in there right now willing to help you out with whatever you're doing. Looking for a job, need help with CCNA, we got you. Link below to join that. And did you know I'm on social media? Are you following me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, everywhere? Well, I am. So go follow. Um, everything is Network Chuck at Network Chuck. I post there sometimes. So go follow me sometimes. And if you want to help me do more of this, creating free training on YouTube, creating low cost courses in other places, you can join my membership, become part of the team. You can either join through YouTube with the join button below or go sign up at thisisit.io. I got links below for everything. Or my Patreon. I got a Patreon as well. Oh, and don't forget to enter the Boson contest. I'm giving away three copies of their NetSim for CCNA and their new courseware for CCNA. And it's it's amazing. So uh, contest is ending like soon. So you better hurry. And if you're too late and you didn't win, no worries. I got a special link below. You get 15% off. So check that out. Tell them I sent you. It does help out a lot when you buy their stuff through my links. Okay, yeah, that's all I got. I'll catch you guys later.